Hello. My name is Philip Quick, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Troy Library. And I'd like to welcome you to the Troy Public Library for today's panel entitled, What Employers Really Want. <clears throat> we will soon be hearing from a panel of Troy area employers who will discuss with you hiring trends, the qualities they are looking for in employees, and what things you should emphasize during that job interview. This panel is the third session in a four-part series this month at the library directed toward job seekers and those looking for employment. Previously, we had programs on resume tips and acing the job interview. Tomorrow, in the fourth and last session at 7 p.m., we'll have the final session called Using Library Resources in Your Job Search. There's still room in this program. So I would encourage you to come back to the library tomorrow evening for that. And there's some flyers on the back table for the uh, program tomorrow evening. This series of programs is one of the services offered by the library directed to those looking for work or looking to change careers. Through the year, we offer programs like computer skills for the job seeker, classes on strengthening your Word and Excel skills, and panels and workshops like we have held this past week. For more information, you can go to our website, which is troylibrary.info, and you, for uh, job seekers information, add slash job seekers to that, and you can see what kind of programs we offer. All of these programs are sponsored by the Friends of the Troy Library. The Friends are all volunteer group who run the gift shop immediately to the left outside these doors and the bookshop in the basement. All of the work that they do and all of the money that they raise come back to the, comes back to the library for programs like this and for speakers like this and panels. You can visit the Friends at friendstpl.org. A few housekeeping points. If you have a cell phone, I would encourage you to either turn it off or turn it to vibrate. Nothing more annoying than hearing who let the dogs out at the middle of a presentation. The bathrooms uh, in the library, if you've never been here, the bathrooms are out the door and down the left, down to the hall, past the cafe. Um, and the, tonight's program is being taped by CMN-TV, Community Access TV in Troy. So it'll be on the Troy Community uh, Access channel sometime later this month. I would like now to introduce Kathy Russ, the director of the Troy Library. In her years as a uh, professional librarian, Kathy has sat at the interview table many times and has hired many staff members. You may have heard her yesterday at the Acing the Job interview program. Um, she knows what to do and what to say, and more importantly, what not to do and say during that job interview and during that job search. Uh, Kathy will moderate today's panel and int introduce the panelists. And without further ado, Kathy Russ, the director of the Troy Library. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, everybody. Um, some of you are familiar faces to me from last night, so if, if, um, if you're coming back, welcome back. If you're new to um, the program, welcome. We're just so glad to have everybody here. Um, as Philip mentioned, this is a panel discussion to help you learn what employers really want. I'm going to act as the facilitator tonight, which means I'm going to ask the panel some questions that they're going to respond to. These are more formal questions, um, things that, that we think are sort of general that, that you all will want to know. Once we're finished with those questions, we're going to give you an opportunity to ask what questions you might have. Um, you are in for a treat. This is a powerhouse panel. We have Karen Stonehouse, who is the district manager for Kelly Services. And then we have Brian Kishnick, who is Troy's city manager. And then we have Lisa Ouellette, who is director of human resources for Beaumont Hospital in Troy and Gross Point. So I think we should give them a round of applause to say thank you for coming out. <laughs> I know I really appreciate their participation, and I'm sure you do too. So without further ado, I would like to ask the panel to get us started. And um, Karen, if you could just tell us um, we know who you are, but what do you do, and how did you get there? Certainly. Um, yes, my name is Karen Stonehouse, and uh, I am a district manager at Kelly Services, and I, I'm responsible in particular for uh, all of southeastern Michigan uh, engineering professional and technical type positions. And I've been doing this for about 18 years uh, in the field of uh, technical recruiting and staffing. 
Uh, actually, was a um, started my uh, career at a at a family business and uh, was HR director and did recruiting and staffing there, and then had an opportunity to uh, buy into a staffing company right here in Troy down the street, uh, and I was a partner in that company for about nine years, and uh, after that had an opportunity to uh, move uh, along into this opportunity at, Kel at Kelly Services. So. Um, been here about, oh gosh, only about a year and a half at Kelly, but again, been in the business for about 18 years altogether. So, seen it all when it comes to interviewing and heard it all when it comes to what employers are looking for. So, hopefully, I can shed some light on it for you tonight. Thank you. Yep. Oh, the mic, that's right. And I'm Brian Kishnick, the city manager. I've been here about the same amount of time, actually, in Troy in southeast Michigan last November, a year ago November, so just over a year. Um, how I got started, how I got here from Troy is a mystery to me, <laughs> and uh, I still try to figure that out every day. And then what do I do? I, uh, I'm in charge of whatever the positive things happening in Troy are. That's what I'm involved in. <laughs> And all the potholes that you might see <laughs> popping up or the snow that's not getting plowed on a quick basis, uh, that's, I don't do any of that. There's other people. No. So we're in charge of, of all public uh, services and from finance to public works to police to fire in the city of Troy. And I started, uh, I started as an engineer, a 16-year-old. I was an engineer in the city of Saginaw. So some people called me a whiz kid. Um, but really, I was just drove the train. I was the <laughs> train engineer. So I really wasn't a civil engineer at all, but I got started in local government in the city of Saginaw. Started at the zoo, went to um, the city of Saginaw, Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, city of Lansing, Ingham County, Largo, Florida, uh, Vassar, Michigan, uh, a place called Titabawassee, which is uh, Saginaw, Midland uh, area, um, and then now Troy, Michigan, and it's it's been a, a great uh, career and a great opportunity to uh, work with various people and, and hire a lot of people. And I'll just say right now, I've made a lot of very good hires and I've made a lot of very bad hires. So uh, hopefully we can talk about that as we go along. Hi, good evening. My name is Lisa Olat, um, as Kathy indicated, from uh, Beaumont Health System. I have responsibility for human resources functions not only at the Troy Hospital, uh, but also at our Gross Point facility and our home health services facility. So all in all, all about 7,000 employees I have responsibility for. Um, my team primarily um, works in terms of recruitment and employee relations with, the, with those uh, divisions. And how I got to where I am, I've been with Beaumont for the last 16 years. It's been probably the best 16 years of my life. It's a great organization. Um, and spent about, hmm, about 27 years in human resources and 23 of those years in, in healthcare. I previously worked for the Henry Ford Health System uh, before I came to Beaumont, but my background's a little bit interesting. I didn't start my studies in human resources. Um, instead, I became an elementary school teacher. Um, many of those same concepts I can apply to my, <laughs> my, my work today, I'm happy to say. Um, but I, I, at the time that I had graduated college, I, I really couldn't find a position. You know, the market's been up and down, up and down for teachers. It was a long time ago. I was working in HR at the time as a clerical support person and found that I just really enjoyed it. Uh, so went on to get my master's degree and uh, high-level certification in human resources and never have doubted um, or, or felt bad about my decision since. It's just been a, a wonderful journey. Um, we hire at Beaumont Health System about, uh, we've hired 3,500 employees last year, I think, including our contingent staff. Uh, so hopefully I'll have a thing or two to share with you in terms of uh, what makes a good um, employee and some of those things we don't necessarily want to see in an interview to help you out. Perfect, thank you. So we're gonna get started and I think we're gonna start out, um, we're gonna maybe go from the general and, and head for the specifics. So um, Karen, if you can um, give us your thoughts on what makes a good interview candidate. What kind of behaviors do you like to see in an interview? Okay, well I can tell you first and foremost that most of the, the best interview candidates are well prepared. And I say that and it sounds like it's, it would be obvious, of course, that you'd be well prepared, but not always the case. And I think oftentimes folks think they'll go to a, uh, an employer's website and take a look at the website and understand what the company's about. And yes, you should do that. But I always can tell a difference when a candidate has gone above and beyond, 
even you know googling uh, the person that they're interviewing with googling the, the company to find out you know the latest press releases just to have more information than the obvious because again it tells me right away that someone has you know taken that extra step uh, that that also someone is uh, able to articulate what they've accomplished I think that's to me so important and many of us aren't where we go into an interview and I think we talk about uh, our job as though we rattle it off like it's a job description. I hear that all the time. Well, sure, sure, you say what you do at a job, but if you cannot articulate where you, what your accomplishments are, the, the person interviewing you has no idea what you can do once you hit the door, once you start working for them, and that's really what they want to talk, they want to hear. It's a lot of, a lot of behavioral questions in interviews nowadays, and we, maybe we can talk more about that, but uh, it's so important to be able to give examples. The best candidates give concise, specific examples of their accomplishments, what they did, not just what they did on a team, but what their role was in, on the team. I think those are some of the things that have come to my mind first and foremost about some of the best interviews that I've sat in on. Please, sir, Brian, you want to chime into that? Those are great points. Um, I would just add a couple of other things that we're looking for uh, when we're interviewing candidates. Um, you know, in this day and age, we're all doing more with less. We're hiring a little bit more. We're broadening the scope of individuals' positions. So really, what's really important is for you to be able to demonstrate in an interview some of the um, examples from your past work um, history where you have worked really well with others, uh, where you've worked well on a team, where you've collaborated together. Um, and then also where you were able to kind of step out of the box and, and multitask, do some other things um, to try it out, to do things that you weren't necessarily hired to do. I think that's really important to be able to show that flexibility um, in an interview. So I'll go last, just such because everyone's going to say a lot of great things, and I'll, I, so I don't repeat anything here. I'll just kind of step outside the box, and that's kind of the theme for me <laughs> as I go through. And if you saw my last one, you'll know that I'm a little bit out there, and uh, and and I like to be there because um, I, I think that's what you need to do. And I don't think it starts with preparing for an interview. I think it starts right now. You all came here tonight and you are interested in this subject because you want to make yourself better. So leave tonight and find out how are you going to make yourself more marketable, more, more employable, more um, somebody who's taken their skill set and professionalized it to the next level. So how are, you, how are you going to do that after you leave tonight? That's what you need to be talking. And you need to practice, practice, practice. You cannot practice enough. Call somebody up. Call Kathy. Call myself. Say, may I come in and just do a mock interview? Because the more you practice, the more experience you have, the better at it you're going to be and the more natural you are going to come off. So, well, you have to prepare. If you don't prepare, there's, a million, there's a, lots of applicants out there that don't prepare. So they're out because there's only a few jobs. Now, she's got 3,500. We only had 35, I think. So. <laughs> But we had one job where it's a records clerk in the police department that just closed yesterday, 170 applications. This pays $36,000 starting salary, 170 applications. You have to set yourself apart, first of all, on paper on the resume. So take the job description, take your resume, and make sure you give examples, you, you connect the dots of the two so when the reviewer looks at it, you're doing the job for them. They look at the job description, they know what the skill set needed is, and you put, you show your resume and how it matches up and have specific examples, both on paper and when you come to the interview. So, and so that starts today though. You can't get to the interview and, or the night of the interview or the week before the interview and start preparing. Go through it right now. Do that self-assessment right now and you'll be on your way to being the best person for the job and it'll be natural. It won't be something that you just put together in a nice neat little package. So in other words, don't wing it. <laughs> don't wing it. Speaking of winging it, what are some behaviors you don't want to see in an interview? Lisa, do you want to take that one? Several, um, but I think <laughs> I think the the thing that really makes our skin crawl uh, when we're interviewing others is people who take the the time when they're supposed to be showcasing themselves, what they've done, um, to badmouth 
previous employers or badmouth previous bosses. Um, it really is off-putting to someone that you're interviewing with um, to come out and say things that are disparaging against a boss or um, a former company. And there's ways around, you know, you'll get asked those questions. You know, employers will try to find out why you're leaving, why you left. And as tempting as it might be, I wouldn't go there. There are different things that you can uh, say and respond to questions that you get. Lots of good examples on the internet in terms of how you can get around being truthful, yet being respectful to those that you've worked for and that you've worked with. Same question? Same question. <laughs> OK, yeah, the, the list is so long, isn't it? Um, there's so many things to cover. But I brought something I thought, we, you, I thought might be interesting to you, uh, some information here. Um, some examples of candidates crossing a line during an interview uh, were you know, inappropriate behavior, let's say. 55% uh, of this, in this study, people that were uh, doing interviews came back and said 55% of the people looked bored during the interview. 53% of them dressed inappropriately. 53%. 53% came across arrogant. 50% were bad-mouthing previous employers, like Lisa said. 49% were answering their cell phone during an interview. 49%, can you imagine? 39% did, did no homework to prepare with information about the role or the company. 20% were providing too much information and personal information and asking personal questions of the interviewer. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, so obviously those are things not to do. The other thing, one of the things that gets me, and I've said in on so many interviews, is someone who cannot answer concisely. I mean, you have to be prepared. That's why, as Brian was saying, you have to really practice and do mock interviews because so often I've sat in on interviews at General Motors, which I had to do for a long time. We'd have to take a candidate there and, and we'd have to sit in with them on the interview and people would go off on tangents and they couldn't even re really remember what the question was. They never kind of circled back around to what the question was. And even the interviewer kind of forgot what the question was because <laughs> the guy's off or the gal's off, you know, way in left field. So again, you have to be concise and have your, your examples and your answers prepared and, and make them, uh, you know, again, the first impression comes in about the first 30 seconds of that interview. So keep in mind that how you, know, how you dress, how you look, how, how confident you are, uh, is, is so important in the first few minutes. So I brought my seven-year-old daughter with me tonight who's in a different room and as we were coming here she asked what we were doing and I said well, this it's about uh, interview skills and I said what do you think you should do to make a good impression um, to, to look good if you want a job when you're talking to somebody else and she said I think you should comb your hair and brush your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's bad advice. I, I don't mean to simplify this or uh, dumb it down, but folks, the first, as she said, the first that you you have to get past the first impression. You have to look and act professional. Um, so that's that's number one as a starting point. And then I'll just leave it at this. I'm, my biggest frustration. It, well, there's two frustrations. The first is when I ask people, what do you know about the city of Troy, or whatever city I was hiring for, what, what do you know? And they really don't know anything about the city of Troy. It goes back to her first comment. You have to research the company, the people. That doesn't mean you have to name drop, and of course we get a lot of name dropping in interviews. It's, it's not about name, it's about understanding the city or the company that you're interviewing with and making sure it's a genuine understanding. And it's, and it's deeper than superficial, okay? That's, that's number one. So say, know something about the company or the city. And then you will be asked, in my, in my experience, you will 100% of the time be asked, why do you want this job? Have a good answer, an, whether it's an elevator speech, so it's 30 seconds or three minutes, but tie it all together and it needs to be rehearsed so that it's then natural. Think about it, think about it. Why do you want this job and why should we hire you? You're going to be asked it so you might as well set yourself apart with the answer because you are guaranteed to have the opportunity. One of the things we talked about last night in the interview skills class is um, 
people are uncomfortable with the idea of talking about themselves. They feel like they're bragging or they feel like they're arrogant or they feel like they're um, quote unquote tooting their own horn. How would you address that question? Whoever wants to go first. Well, again, you know, this is your opportunity to get this job. You have to be able to market yourself. I, I, would, I would say it's so critical for you to get to that first impression, those first 30 seconds. Uh, you have to be able to get past that and not feel as though you're arrogant or, and it, you, you know an answer that's arrogant and one, one, one isn't. Of course, we don't want people to come across that way at all. You want to come across confident. You want to, be, believe it or not, I have to say this, you need to know your own resume. You have to be able to speak to your own resume and you have to be able to know the job description that you're going after, know it, know it so well. And I, th I find that most of the time people don't give themselves enough credit. They really don't. Uh, I do a lot of interview prepping before someone will go off to our clients for an interview and ask them some questions. For example, I like to ask them, give me three words to describe you, your, your strengths as they relate to this job. And more often than not, I get back the answer as well, I'm dependable and I'm, you know, I'm on time and I'm, you know, ethical and, and, and that's all wonderful, but quite frankly, I expect that. Mm -hmm. What I want to hear from them are three words that describe maybe their technical ability and their strength as it relates to the job. It, again, it tells what they can do as soon as they get hired on that, for that position. So does that make sense? Yeah. Sounds to me. Yeah. <laughs> I think what's really important too, it is, it is your opportunity to shine as you alluded to. You have to take that opportunity to sell yourself, to market yourself. Um, it is all about you. And if you're not the one doing the most talking in that interview, <laughs> there's, a, there's a problem with the interview. But I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about the interview, but it also goes beyond the interview. So after, your inter after you've interviewed, follow-up is really, really important. Um, following up with the individual, thanking them for their time. And then what I find most um, interesting, too, is when people think of, because you're not going to think of everything in an interview. You're going to be nervous. You're going to be anxious. There's going to be things that you forget to point out, think great projects that you've worked on or teams that you've led. You might maybe want to add something in your follow-up to that interviewer um, about something additional. Um, that they might want to know, you know, about you. So that's really important um, as, as well as follow-up. And I'll also mention, too, um, you know, you're not only being um, judged by the person that's interviewing you, but the office staff as well. So the people you interact with in the lobby, the receptionist, that is so important. I can't tell you how many candidates that we've disqualified based upon their behaviors or their interactions with the office staff. Uh, we've had people on their cell phones in the office waiting to be interviewed, very small office, um, it, you know, overhearing some of the things that they've said, telling the recruiter, wait, I'll be right with you, finishing up their phone call. Those are all important things to remember, too, that you're not only interacting with the person that's interviewing you, but the entire team and the entire staff. So the, the question of the people don't want to talk about themselves because they feel like they're boasting, you're in the wrong game. You're in the wrong arena then because the, the bottom line is the interviewers are asking questions about you, about your experience, about your success, about your failures. You need to be able to communicate that, period. So I don't, I don't know what else I could add to that except that if you're going to follow up, I always appreciate follow up that is handwritten in a card of some sort, mm -hmm. not email, that anybody can do, definitely not a text. <laughs> but, I mean, communication has taken us to a whole new level, and I have to con continue to believe that I'm young enough to not say, you know, technology's bad. It's, not, it's wonderful, but remember, you're trying to touch, you're trying to communicate, you're trying to connect, and you need to do that with a personal touch. And email is not personal and text is not personal. Um, if you need to, follow it up with that, but then f uh, email and then follow it up with right. a personal card. Right, That's just my personal preference. We're, if you don't mind, we're going to go through some of these other questions and then we'll have a plenty of opportunity at the end. So hold on to that thought. Okay. Um, you all represent a, ver a, a variety <coughs> of industries, a variety of fields. So what, would you, what advice do you have for a candidate who um, maybe is, is coming into your field, coming into your industry, changing, changing careers, um, new to the work? Well, let's leave it at that and then go into other things later. So 
um, if are you looking for specific experience? Are you looking more for skills? What are you really looking for when you hire? So I'll, I'll take this first just and, and be brief. What, most of the people I hire, I'm not hiring for skills. And I learned a long time ago, I, I'm hiring the person. I believe that we can train most people for most of the jobs that we are hiring for. I'm, I'm hiring for the person who has the, the right approach, the best attitude, who has the most growth potential, who's professional, and has a base level of technical knowledge and experience, what, whatever, the, whatever that may be, given the job. But I'm hiring the person first, I think this is the question, person first and all the technical skills second. So. Well, we're pretty technical in the hospital. <laughs> so, <laughs> so clearly, <laughs> we, we definitely need, for, for most jobs, but there are many jobs in the hospital that aren't technical. Um, but when it does come to, I would agree with Brian, when it does come to those technical skills, um, you, you got to be a nurse to be a nurse at the hospital, so we're going to look at that first. But if I have a nurse who maybe is lacking a few skills or some experience, but their customer service, and, and I know from that interview that the way that they're going to treat patients is exactly what we're looking for, I'll teach those other skills or get them the experience that they need to be successful um, in that role. That's really important. Um, I think the question was in terms of getting back into the workforce, getting into the industry. There's, first of all, you need to know if you're not a healthcare professional, there are a number of positions uh, within Beaumont Health System that are not technically related. We have a librarian in the Beaumont Health System uh, that works with our medical school, for example. Um, lots of clerical support staff. Um, with 20,000 employees, you know, you have to keep the place running. So what a lot of people do and what we actually saw back in 2009 and 2010 when we saw the market change and uh, the economy change, we saw a lot of people actually changing careers at that time. We had a lot of engineers, we had a lot of people that were in automotive that went back to school, became nurses, became other healthcare professionals. Um, but what I would recommend to you, uh, we have a huge volunteer workforce at Beaumont Health System. So if healthcare is something that is really of interest to you and you want to find out more about the organization and what it has to offer, and if that's really a good fit for you, uh, volunteering uh, um, is always a great thing to do. Um, the other thing that I might recommend is a lot of employers will allow you to job shadow, to come in and actually job shadow with a professional uh, for an hour, a couple hours a day, uh, depending on the position. Um, just, uh, again, to, to get you some exposure um, to the work environment to see if that might be a, a good fit for you. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk about uh, folks that have been out, you know, out of the work force for a while and how do you get noticed you know I always say that I'm sure that you've heard a, a lot of tips about resumes uh, you know obviously you're trying to get your resume on the A pile and then you want to get your resume to the top of the A pile right well you've, you've got to strike against you when you've been out of the workforce for a while quite frankly and this is a, a we, we call this in my industry there's a war on talent we cannot find enough talented people we can't find enough engineers by any means. Now, if you've been out of the workforce for a while, because, because there is a shortage, that's an advantage to you. Uh, if you're shortage in technical uh, type of openings like, like engineering. But let's say you've been out for five years and you're trying to re-enter the workforce. How are you going to sell yourself? How are you going to make, that, make a difference so that someone doesn't say, oh, they've been out too long, their skills. So you have to be able to focus on your your transitional skills, maybe what what have you been doing during, during those five years that have kept your skills current, even it's, if it's attending seminars, anything that you can put on that resume or talk about in an interview that says you've been still actively involved in the field that you'd like to get back into. I think that's really critical. And somehow you have to be able to include that on a resume and be able to articulate that in, in an interview. So, I mean, again, the market the way it is right now for us on the very technical side is there's not enough people so that's an advantage to you right now but you have to take advantage of that and be able to again sell yourself in that resume because that's the first way to get your foot in the door for the interview and to be able to capture those skills that you know especially those skills you know don't really change you know if you're if it's a very technical position uh, some of those you know they'll change every year Let's think of cell phones how they've evolved right 
but there's certain skills and, and characteristics that you have that you know never change in your industry. That's what you want to play up. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so let's talk about trends. Um, you know, we've had seen so many changes in this area with the auto industry and layoffs, and now things seem to be recovering, which is fabulous. But that always, you know, change brings about more change. So have you seen any trends um, in terms of, of what you're looking for, different types of qualities in people? We've talked a lot about skills and experience, but qualities maybe that you're looking for now that you that are more more important than a couple of years ago just anything on that topic of trends well I I can I can say that the let me talk about the trend of the the hiring trend right now in my industry there's a shortage of technical uh, people that ha have the technical skills that we need so what we find that uh, with this shortage comes you know the opportunity to um, uh, for the, it's really an it's really an employees market right now. A few years ago, it was an employers market. So right now, the employees are having opportunities. They're getting two and three, four, four phone calls for for jobs, Th three and four offers at a time. It's it's kind of unheard of, really. So when you think about that, you think about you know, th that market right now, is just um, ripe for the taking. I mean. We, we do so much passive recruiting right now. We're talking to a lot of people that are unemployed and, and are looking for, looking for folks that, I mean, there's just a not, there's way more openings than there are people. So again, it's an opportunity for you to, you know, get into these technical fields and be able to, you know, to get a job and to get several offers of jobs. I mean, it's, it's insane. We used to do a lot of, at Kelly, it was mostly contract positions that we filled. It's all direct placement right now. I mean, that's how it's changed. This war on talent has changed my industry drastically to the point where it's not so much, um, you know, the, the contract positions, but you're going to get direct offers with better benefits right now. So this is all really exciting and, and encouraging, I, I think, because it hasn't been that way for quite a while. So, again, um, you know, I, ju I just think this is a great time to be in the technical field. If you're in, you know, math skills, you've got engineering skills, you've got any kind of IT technical skills, scientifics, uh, which would even would uh, flow over into uh, healthcare, um, at, you absolutely have an opportunity to probably get several interviews. And and if you a afterwards, if you have any questions, you can come and talk to me about it. But um, we certainly need those kind of people desperately right now. knew I wanted to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I touched on a few things uh, before. Just, you know, the ability to multitask, the ability to work as a, a team is really, really important. Um, and also, I think, um, maybe managing your expectations. If you're just getting back into the workforce or you haven't worked in a while, you know, the trend in healthcare in terms of hiring we don't know where Obamacare is going to take us um, as a hospital. You know, we, we think we're going to get busier, which is good, but we know our reimbursement is going to be lower, which is bad. So right now for us, we're being very cautious in our hiring. So instead of hiring a lot of permanent staff that are benefited staff, we're doing a lot more hiring of contingent staff. You know, these are staff that are not benefited, um, but get hours, make the same wage, uh, but don't have access to those benefits. So just manage your expectations a little bit. Um, if you're interested in getting into healthcare, a lot of the employees are being a little bit cautious in terms of ensuring not to bring too much staff on. So if we start to see some negative changes in terms of reimbursement, we're not fi don't find ourselves in a situation that we're contributing to the to the unemployment rate. So just manage your expectations um, a little bit. So the one trend that I noticed is, is not a trend at all. It's a constant over time, which is just find a way to get experience in the field that you want to work in. And that doesn't mean you have to try to hit the home run right out of the batter's box, right? Find the, the area, the field, the, the office, the organization, what, whatever it is. Find that which you're, which you're interested in and what, what your passion is. And then take the positions that you can get in that in that arena to get experience and then the rest will follow. I was a city manager at the age of 25. First of all, that's way too young, okay? But that's what I wanted to do. So I worked for free, I worked for free in all these different areas knowing that I could get it moved around, found a way to get the, the position 
and then and then work my way up. You can do that in most organizations, but you, a you have to be paid. The trend that hasn't changed is you have to be patient. You have to find your passion, and you have to work toward towards getting into that organization, that environment, at whatever level you can. And then it opens the door, it opens your eyes, it opens your knowledge base, and then you build your strategy from there. You can't, build, you can't be here and build your strategy for here. That's my trend that you can't do. You, you build your strategy from the ground up and keep refining that strategy. After you find your passion, because I'm not somebody who, I get job offers all the time to go in different areas, not city management. I say, no, this is what my passion is. And I'm going to keep finding ways to deliver within my passion. I'm going to step out of my facilitator role for a minute, if you'll forgive me, because um, I want to add something to that. I would strongly encourage you to consider how flexible you are, how adaptable you are. Things change all the time. And if you have kind of a rigid outlook, and, and I don't mean rigid in the negative sense, it, but I guess I do, because if you just like to see things one way, you're going to be really upset and disappointed when you're on your job. You have, to, you have to consider change. You have to consider that line on job postings that we see sometimes and other duties as required. This is no longer a culture of it's not my job. Everything's your job. Everything's my job. Maybe not so much at the hospital. I wouldn't tag in for brain surgery. But I think you want to show that you're willing to help where it's needed. You're willing to learn to do what's needed. And you're really, really, really okay with that. So if somebody asks you to do something, you don't drag your feet and moan and groan and sigh. Adaptability, be receptive to change, go with it, and be positive about it. That will make you a valuable employee. I'm sorry, I had to throw that in. So, so what advice would you give to people who go on job interviews and haven't had success? Karen, you were talking about how it's an employee's market right now. Um, but for people who maybe haven't had that kind of success, um, what, do you, what, what advice can you offer? Well, I think if you're struggling, uh, you have to kind of step, step back and ask yourself a few questions. You know, why, why do I think I'm struggling? Uh, is it my resume? Is it that I'm trying to fit, you know, a square peg in a round hole? Is this not quite a good fit for me, like Brian said? Is this, do you have a passion for this? If you don't have a passion for what you're trying to do or get into, uh, it's going to come across in an interview. It really will. So um, I think I would ask yourself that question. I would ask yourself, you know, to be very brutally honest with yourself about your interviewing skills, about what your resume looks like. And again, like I said, about the field that you're going into. Is this really something for you? Or is it just a job that you're looking for? And believe me, it does come across in an interview when it's just a job. So I think you have to do some real personal assessment there. And then, you know, and ask others. Uh, again, maybe that mock interview, you know, how, how, do, how am I coming across to people uh, and when I talk about this job? Here's the job description. Here's the job I'd like to interview for. And how am I coming across? And if you're not sounding enthusiastic, you know, oftentimes we say, I think we talked about earlier, attitude and aptitude. You've got to come across, that's going to get you way further in some cases than even your technical knowledge. It's your attitude and your aptitude, your enthusiasm. And, you know, I look in the, in the audience here and, and we, we look at all of us who are looking for employment and as we are older workers, uh, boy, I tell you what, you got to come across knowledgeable. You got to come across savvy when it comes to new technology. You've got to come across enthusiastic and you've got to look like, you know, you, you can run a marathon because, again, you know, that's what folks are looking for. I think another thing that I would add, I'm always amazed. I talk to a lot of employees um, throughout the week who we have a very strong internal bidding process um, at Beaumont Health System. So about 20% of our uh, employees were promoted last year or transferred into other positions. So that's really great. Um, but there's a number of employees that apply for jobs. They don't get them. And I'm, never, I'm always amazed when I sit down and talk with them. First question I ask is, did you ask for feedback? Did you ask why you didn't get the position or why you maybe weren't, you know, considered the best candidate? 
and many of them don't. And I think that's really important uh, to the best of your ability. I know our companies are very different in terms of the information that they share. But I think if you don't get a position, I think it, I would be out there asking why. Um, and then I'd also add to that, there's nothing wrong with if you don't get that position, but following it up with, I understand that I wasn't your choice for this position, but if you have other positions um, in the future that you feel I'm better suited for, uh, please keep me in mind. I'm very interested in working for your company. Employers want people that are interested, truly interested in working for their company. So that will show your interest. So just, the, just to add to that, if a door closes, uh, one will open. There's a door's going to, if you look, look at this audience, like you say, I mean, you've all had life experiences where doors have closed, and you know another one opens, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm not being trite about it. It's the problem's going to be solved. You just have to keep a positive, energetic, optimistic, and plug in away, and guarantee time, not very much time will go by, and you, it will happen. Mm -hmm. It may be not the level you, you were originally desired, but it's going to happen. Something's going to happen, and then you take it from there. Uh, but you have to be gracious, and you have to be positive. Uh, so read the next book, have the next conversation, move on. That wasn't meant for you. Get the feedback. Now what's next for me with a big smile on your face? Because it's going to happen. Things are going to, this is the land of opportunity. No matter how bad it is, there's, I always said in, in 08, you know, they were talking about 08 and the crash and how bad things were and everybody wasn't just leaving Troy. They were leaving the state and, you know, weren't, they weren't coming back. Well, you know what? These cities are broke. I say these cities aren't broke. We have $55 million dollars. Yeah, well, we used to have $80 million, right? <laughs> but we still have $55 million. That's great. We still can do things. Well, the same thing. People are, they will be hiring somebody, right? So why not you? You heard that with the, the Super Bowl the other night, right? With the, <laughs> what the guy said. I love that. I'm going to tell my kid. Why not me? You know, but it might not be me with you, right? Your organization or, or me with this organization. But why not me somewhere? It's going to be somewhere. It goes back to you have to be a bit flexible. You, you know, you can't uh, frame yourself in and, and really hold yourself back. You have to be willing. I never thought I'd move to Southeast Michigan. Never. <laughs> um, and here I am, one of the best things that's ever happened um, for a lot of reasons. So. Cool. And sometimes the job you don't get is a blessing because it leads you to the great job you do. Very true. So. Anyway, I won't get in. I, <laughs> I had my turn last night. Okay, well now I think we've come to the, the portion of our, of our discussion um, where I, I think our audience would really love to hear from each one of you whatever advice you want to give and for, for however much and for however long you want to go because when, when you're finished with that, we're going to open it up to the audience questions. Someone else start. Yeah. <laughs> I, keep I mean, I think I just said it. You know, I, I'll, my summary can be can be what I just said. You, you know, f think about what we've said. Go back over the the, the video or whatever these things are called these days. Um, but ha find your passion. Find a way. Be energetic and be positive and know that good things are going to happen. It might not just be the the level, the timing, what you think you're going to what you think you're going to obtain, but but be positive after you find your passion and go after it. It's, it's going to happen. So, Actually, Brian, before you're done, yeah. maybe I can add a second part to this question. Yeah. Once they have the job, what do you want them to do? Yeah, well, I want you to be 110%, right? Because it becomes, like she said, aptitude and attitude. It becomes more about attitude once you're on the job. In my experience, right, it's the person who wants to be the team player. It's the person who wants to bring new ideas. The, and in my world, I get many new ideas that I say no to several of them. So if, I, if, if you're said no to in your new idea, don't take that as, well, this organization isn't for me. Take the positive approach. Well, they didn't like that one. I'll, I'll show them this, right? Keep challenging yourself on the job at 110% being positive and looking for new ideas, looking for ways you can help. I remember when I first started in the Ingham County Budget Office, I was a lowly budget analyst uh, making $7 an hour and uh, working about 80 hours a week 
And I loved it because we put the budget together and we were young and we actually had an accomplishment and we were always trying to find ways to challenge uh, the county controller who was, who was really <laughs> very smart and very challenging um, to work for, but for good reason. So I was, we were always trying to challenge uh, and that's what I would advise you to do. So that's kind of long-winded, but. No, that's good. Thank you. I think once once you get the job, um, just adding to what Brian said, I think it's really important to show that you're, at Beaumont, we like to call it, you're an owner. You're not a renter. So you're not renting the apartment. You're owning the house. So you're an employee there. You own everything that happens around you. Um, we learned this from our CEO. He would, con you know, if there was a, a piece of paper in the hallway, he'd, he'd bend over and personally pick it up and throw it away. That, that's an example of being an owner. Um, if there's a problem, you take the initiative to get, you know, to get things fixed. I think being flexible, getting involved. Um, what's really important, too, is to keep up with, once you have a position in a company, keep up with what's going on in the company. Make sure that you're really tuned in to uh, communications uh, that flow, what's going on in your industry that's really, really important um, to stay on top of and understand. And, and be, you know, don't be passive. Don't wait for someone to share the information with you. Be assertive and aggressive and identify where to get the information and how you can keep in, in the loop so that you're always on top of that. And that will help you be an owner versus a renter. You know, I, th I think when you're on the job, once you've got the job, um, you have the responsibility of keeping the job. So with that comes a lot of um, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to shine. I mean, the folks that, that it's amazing how many times, especially in the contract labor workforce, how often we run across people who get the job and they, they can't even, seriously can't even be there on time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the obvious things, first and foremost. But then how do you set yourself apart from everyone else? Of course, you're going to be on time. You're going to be dependable and you're going to put in a good day's work. That's expected. But be above and beyond that, again, if you, and again, if you have a passion, passion for your job, it will come easy. But beyond that, you have to be the, I talked about putting the resume to the A pile. Well, now you've got the job. How are you going to stay an A employee? I mean, and most of us know ways to do that. And it's being flexible. It's being cooperative, helpful, pitching in. So many companies are, are doing so much more with less people. So there is an expectation level that you will do this and you will be flexible. The employers all, tell me all the time, I need someone who will be flexible. I need someone who, if I say this isn't quite on your job description, that you will still do it or help me. I mean, I, can't, I, I just cringe when I hear the fact that someone wouldn't do it because, oh, it wasn't on their job description or they didn't feel it was their responsibility. I mean, that's not the kind of employer that, employee that's going to stay in that job. So again, that's what I'm looking for, and I'm hoping that people really realize what does it take to stay on the job? Because it's, it's all too often, too easy for employers to, to just say, well, you know what, we're going to trade up. We use the expression, they're going to trade up because this person isn't flexible. They're not uh, cooperative. They're not a team player. Uh, they have all, all the technical skills in the world, but they have no, no soft skills, no relationship skills, interaction, they, and they're not enthusiastic. And, and open to change and open to uh, to being flexible. So I, that's the best advice I could give. Once you once you have the job, keep it. Yeah, I, I have to do this again. Sorry, but I'd say stay in good touch with your boss. Whether it's asking for feedback, like Brian said, bringing those new ideas. Um, you know, I think you want to be respectful and not be in, in that person's face every moment of the day. But have a good line, an open line of communication, so your boss knows that he or she can tell you, you know, hey, good job, and, you know, you won't burst into tears, or, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you'd work on this a little bit and you won't burst into tears. So it's more feedback as opposed to criticism. Um, I think that that'll really help you. I have employees here who, who talk to me on a regular basis about just their days and things, and, and from that I know them. And so I could tell you three people who I would love to promote to a management position tomorrow if I could because now I know them. I know everybody here, but some people really take the time to talk to me. So, um, you know, don't, don't be um, cloying about it and don't be insincere about it, but I think it's good to, to know your boss. So, any last thoughts before we open it up to the, to the room? 
No? Yeah. All right. Well, here's how this works, folks. Um, because I'm the one with the microphone, you, um, I'll, I'll call on you, kind of like school, but I'll call on you. You'll ask your question, then I'm going to repeat the question because we um, want to make sure that it's recorded on tape. I'm under strict instructions to do that. So, um, so we'll um, have you say the question, then I'll say the question, and then our panelists will respond to the question. Everybody cool with that? Okay. So this lady in the second row had her hand up before. So ma'am, what is your question? Okay. Um, to anyone in the panel, saying that I went on an interview, I didn't get the position, but I'm interested in the company. Would you be comfortable with me calling like once a month? Just, hi, um, do you have any positions? Or, and also, how would I phrase that? Okay. So the question is, um, if you go on an interview and you don't get the position, what's the comfort level with following up and the time frame, you know, once, once a week, once a month, just to see if there are any additional open positions or to touch base with the potential future employer? Well, cer certainly I would welcome a call from somebody who was extremely interested in working for my company. Uh, yeah, I would say on once a month basis, no problem with that at all. Again, you know, you don't want to be pe uh, stalking anybody or you don't want to be pesky, but again, if it if phrased right, you know, just checking in with you to see what other opportunities you may have. I'm still extremely interested in your company. Um, you know, is there anything open right now that I might apply for? Uh, certainly I would have no problem with that. Quite frankly, I, I think that'd be fine. I think too, um, so depending on the employer that you're, you know, a lot of these applicant tracking systems, um, you know, technology these days, they actually have ways to keep you connected. So if you're interested in a human resources position, um, a lot of the systems you can actually put in, notify me via email uh, when one of these positions opens up. So that's really a nice way to kind of be passive about it. But I too would welcome a call or, you know, even an email is appropriate in this day and age. You know, we have found ourselves having to be a little bit more flexible in terms of the way that the generations communicate. Um, I think the most important thing is that communication. Um, so, you know, regardless how you do that, we're, we're fine with that. So just to be the other side of this, I would not welcome a call once a month. Um, and I think it would be over the top to contact me once a month or contact. Now, if you're contacting HR and you're keeping up regularly, regularly with them, I think that's very appropriate. Um, but, but be cognizant of who you're, mm -hmm. who you're contacting because that would be seen, depending on how many positions come open. And, you know, you really have to assess the situation. Contacting me or a department head in the city or, you know, in an organization I think would be too much. And, and I think would turn into a negative very quickly. Um, but like they said, there's lots of ways to keep on top of it. And then maybe a, maybe a you know, one-time contact and maybe come in and talk. Um, but that would, be, that would be where I would keep it. Well, and I'd like to add on to that because you brought a good point. I mean, I'm coming from a staffing industry. So, you know, definitely you want to keep in touch with me. And, and I can tell you what's available and what's out there. So I would encourage you to really build relationships with good, strong recruiters at reputable staffing companies because we, we can be your advocate. And, and it, when it comes to, you know, keeping in touch, I know you're definitely interested. And again, um, you mentioned the uh, online applying. A lot of, on the other side of that, I think it's good to follow up a lot of times and call in because we call that the black hole sometimes. So, you know, finding a way to get to somebody that you can actually talk to about that position as opposed to just applying to that spot that doesn't. Now, a lot of companies are manage their websites very well and others don't. So when, it, when it's just sitting in there and it becomes a black hole, you've got to get creative and find a way to get to, get to somebody in that company so that you can make a difference. I think another point to keep in mind is, um, you know, again, it gets back to that follow-up. So when you don't get a position, trying to understand why it is that you didn't get the position. And if you're just not qualified and you've been told that and you have nothing new to bring to the table that next month, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't call till you have something new to bring to the table. And then you can say, I, I was in, I interviewed, this is where I fell short. 
Um, just like you to know, this is something that I've done to, to better myself in that area. But, but make sure you've got that feedback so that you know how often you should uh, follow up. And HR really is the best place to do it um, because we're aware of all of the openings in the, the hospital, for example, and really in the health system. So we network pretty, pretty well to, together. But that's your best bet versus calling a manager who has this many openings in their particular department. I th this is where I think preparation is really important because you need to know your industry. I get resumes sent to me all the time and e each and every time I respond, um, the Troy Public Library is a department of the City of Troy. Human Resources handles all of our job postings, so any positions that are available you would have to apply through them. So in other words, sending your resume to me is not going to do you any good. I mean, I can look at it, I can tell you what I think about it, but am I, am I going to circumvent the process? No, I'm not. I can't. I don't have a position for you. So I think you need to know your industry and know who you're dealing with and deal with those people. Go to the right person. And it might take some research on your part to find out who that is. That's where maybe the library can help you if you don't know. But I think you need to, it's incumbent on you to find out who that is. So next question. Yes, ma'am. As an employer, where are you looking for employees? Is it a, a website like LinkedIn or is it Monster? So the question is, as employers, where are you looking for, where are you recruiting your employees these days? Um, Monster.com, LinkedIn, internal postings, word of mouth referrals. How do you find your people? Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. We can't find enough people in my industry, so we're looking everywhere. We do go to Indeed quite a bit, I'll, I'll be honest with you. We use Indeed often, Simply Hired. We use uh, L LinkedIn. Make sure that your LinkedIn profile is up to date. A uh, we, we, little bit of Facebook, but I don't prefer that, quite frankly, and I, I don't encourage that. And when you are looking for a job, you know, your Facebook should change because employers will look. Um, we do, uh, we, will, we will tweet, I mean, to try to find people that way. I mean, because again, we look everywhere. Referrals, out of state. Um, I mean, we just, again, can't find enough people for some of the positions we have. So get your resume out everywhere you possibly can. Again, but I often say, you know, connect with some, some good staffing companies, that can, like Kelly Services, <laughs> <laughs> can help you. And, and my office is in Auburn Hills. So, um, but seriously, uh, you have to be able to, you have to be nimble. You, you have to be nimble. And again, most of you probably know how to do this, but you certainly want to be putting up these alerts wherever you can, like on Indeed or Simply Hired, so that alerts come to you automatically when there's positions that fit what you're looking for. So make sure that you do that. But I mean, I look for people when I'm in the grocery store line. I seriously do. I, I, I overhear a conversation and I'll have my card and I'll hand it out. You know, I, I was just there recently and I heard a woman saying, well, honey, you know, you've graduated now and you've got to find a job in this. And I'm thinking, I said, what does she do? What do you, I said, what are, you, what are you looking to do? Oh, she says, well, I'm, I'm trying to break into purchasing. Oh, here's my card. You know, c call me. So, I mean, seriously, a conversation anywhere. I, I will talk to people in, in, the, in the stores, in the grocery line, uh, restaurants. at restaurants. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you a funny story. One time I walked up to a, a table of people just cold. <laughs> they were all talking. They were at a restaurant. It was a bar-type restaurant. They were having a good time, pizza and beer and all that. And I thought, you know, there's some candidates in this group. I just know there are. <laughs> because I do this often, right? And there usually are candidates in that group. Well, this time I went up to a table of uh, my competitors' recruiters. We're all at the table going out. Yeah. Well, the more interesting part about it was I was handing out my card, and they started to tell me that. And I said, well, you know, we hire recruiters, too. And at the head of the table was the owner of the company. Oh. <laughs> He offered me his card and said, you're going to need to come and talk with me. I like how you recruit. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's great. So the only thing I would add was association, yeah, was uh, you know, websites and, and that kind of thing. But she hit it all. LinkedIn's pretty, pretty popular in the rest. But if you, if you have a specific association in the field that you're um, looking at, then that's somewhere where there's still a lot of postings, I know. So... We actually do job fairs still, so I know it's kind of a thing of the past, but um, you know that could be, depending on the type of job fair and what you're interested in, that could be um, another thing. Uh, we do a lot of alumni recruiting too, so if you're a graduate of a college, um, 
you know, keeping in touch with their placement office from time to time. We'll do some recruitment um, there. And a very strong employee referral program. So if you know anyone that works at Beaumont they're, and we hire you, they're eligible for a bonus. So it Ooh. behooves you to make some friends at, at Beaumont. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, we get about 25% of our hires from our employee uh, referral wow. program. Um, and we also scout our volunteers. So I talked earlier about, you know, if, if you're interested in a company and they provide the opportunity for you to volunteer or job shadow, uh, we have gotten a number of hires uh, from that pool as well. That's great. And for those of you especially who might be discouraged about your job search, I mean, how, how amazing would it be is if you're out with your friends having a good time and you've made a good impression <laughs> and someone walks up and says, hey, give me a call. I mean, even if that didn't take you where you exactly <coughs> wanted to go. What a fabulous compliment. So again, all about the positive. So next question. Yes, sir, in the blue shirt in the second to last row. Yeah. Um, you were oh. talking about you actually hire a person that, because I know that when you have, when you put some, when you have a job description, you have essential skills that somebody has to have. But you were saying that that person can be trained and so how, how, can you give me an example of where you actually, they have to get into the interview. So if they have three of the 10 skill, essential skills that you need, what gets them into that interview? Well, so, yeah, what oh. I, the, well, the first thing I, well, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry, you have to repeat the question. <laughs> sorry. I follow orders. <laughs> this is where I'm rigid, because Daniel yelled I told at me. you I was a little different. <laughs> no, the, the, the question for taping purposes is, um, you know, skills and experience. We've talked about how skills, uh, you know, people can be trained to do things. We're looking for the person. So how does that work, an example? Yeah, so my answer is what I, what I originally said was, and I, I need to communicate this a little better, you have to take the job description and you have to match your resume or application, whatever the case may be. And, and it takes work to put those two together. So the old rifle shot out there, all these resumes, and it doesn't, it, that's not my approach, and I would never recommend you take that approach. I, remember I said, find your passion, find every, and then take that essential job description, and I mean think it through, talk with friends, make it line up as best and honestly as you can, okay? If you only come up with three out of ten, maybe it's not the right job for you anyway, right? If, it's, if, you, if they're looking for nine or ten out of ten. But that's to get on the top of the A pile, or in the A pile, and then to get on the top of the A pile is when I'm when we're sitting there, and I usually do panels, uh, you know, because I just I love interviewing people uh, for jobs, and but I, I like the interaction of the panel. That's where I'm hiring the person. I want to know that you're not sitting there like that. You're not, you know, you're not doing this with your pen. Uh, you have the professionalism. You have the energy. You have the optimism. You're able to communicate. That's the person I'm hiring. But but you have to get in the door mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. And in my world, getting in the door isn't as easy just having a friend contact, right? Mm -hmm. You have to go through a process. And it's not easy, but it's worth it. So that's my answer to you. You know, and cover letters are a lost art. I love cover letters. I hate writing my own, but I like everyone else's. <laughs> because it allows, a resume only allows you to tell some of the story. Cover letter really allows you to tell the story. So if you don't have those two out of the seven skills that employers are looking for, tell it, say it in your cover letter right up front. You know, I recognize I don't have all the qualifications that you're looking for, but here's what I can bring to the table. And here's why I'm interested in your company and why I've been, you know, wanting to get my foot in the door. That's really, really important. Always focus on the cover letter and make sure it's addressed to the right company. Because <laughs> we've gotten a lot from Henry Ford. And, oh. Yeah, and you have to change that. Yeah. That'll get you to the key pile. <laughs> well, and if I could also add, too, that, you know, you certainly want to be able to um, – you talked about you know having only a few of the of the list. I mean, as Brian said, uh, most of the employers are looking for about eighty percent. So if you're if you're not going to match about eighty percent, you know you're going to have a problem. However, uh, if you you know you want to be prepared both in an interview and like like uh, Lisa said on a cover letter to kind of explain how you're close. I will be mo I'm more than happy to talk to someone who has skills that are transferable that are close. And I love in interviews when, and I, and I prep people with an interview to say, no, I don't have that, however, 
I have this. No, I don't know that software, but ho however, I know that one. I know Katia V5 versus Unigraphics, but I'm a good designer. So keep that in mind. Those are the things you want to play up is what do you have that's close? I never, I always tell, tell people double click. Don't ever answer a question in an interview or a phone screen where you just say yes or no. Always expand on that answer mm -hmm. and say, no, I honestly don't know that software. I don't have that particular skill. However, you know, in a recent position, I had an opportunity to do something similar. And that'll, that'll always keep them listening and keep them interested. I would like to add an example. Um, what I hear a lot in interviews, um, you know, why are you interested in this job? Why do you want to work for the Troy Library? I like to read. Well, that's great. I do too. But I can guarantee you I'm not sitting in my office working my way through the Troy Public Library collection. That's not my job. That's not anybody's job at the Troy Public Library. I hear people say I like books. That's great too. You're working with, you're working in an environment that houses a lot of books. But what is this place? It is the Troy Public Library. You are going to be working with people. So if you like books, but you don't like people, this is not the place for you. If you have a ton of library experience, but this podium has more personality than you do, <laughs> I don't want you at the Troy Public Library. If you've worked in retail, if you've worked in a restaurant, if you've worked in any sort of occupation that deals with the public on a regular basis, I can teach you library. What I cannot teach you is a love of public service and a desire to help people. That's what I'm looking for. So does that help? Okay. All right. You're welcome. Sir, in the blue shirt with the mustache. <laughs> Say that is the reason you're looking for a new position, and you're asked, why are you interested in leaving where you are? How should you handle that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and secondly, why would they even ask you that if they didn't want the truth? Okay, so the question <laughs> is, uh, you're not supposed to badmouth a former or present employer. It's not a good thing to do. It's not professional. So if the question is asked of you in an interview, why are you leaving your current position or why did you leave your last position, number one, how, did, how do you handle that question? And number two, why would an employer ask you that question in the first place? I see Lisa's ready to go. Um, I think you have to focus on the opportunity, the, the positive. So what is the opportunity that this potential job might bring you or the experience that it might get you or the environment that you might be able to work in? that you don't have the opportunity to do those things now. So I would always focus on the positive. And the reason why we ask it is we want to make sure that there's the right motivational fit for that position. So if you say, I'm leaving my employer because my role is too defined. You know, I, I do recruitment and employee relations, but I want to do compensation and I want to do benefits. And if this position doesn't offer that necessarily, you're probably not going to be a great fit for it because that's not what you're looking for. So that's why we're asking those questions to determine if you're going to be a good fit for the, the role that we have. But always make it positive for you in terms of what you're looking. Make it look like you're running towards something but not running away from something. That's really important. I would certainly agree with all of that. And I would say and I would caution you very seriously to not go there. If you're asked why you're leaving and the reason is your previous boss, just avoid that. And there's obviously other reasons why you're looking. It's not just that one reason. And don't, and don't make the assumption that, you know, that's why they're asking the question because, again, they really, you really want to see if you're a fit for the position, first and foremost, why you have interest in, in working at this company. And it's, you know, the, the, that's probably one of the last things they think of might be the case. So certainly come up with other reasons why you want to be, as Lisa said, moving forward and what, why you're interested in that company. And I just would caution you never to go, never to go there. It, it, even though, like you say, it's a, it would be brutally honest, but it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's, it's too often in an interview a, a check mark against you right off the bat. You know, it, you can talk about not being a fit for various reasons. 
you know, it wasn't enough of a challenge. It isn't, you know, where I feel passionate enough. I'd rather be in this type of role or your type of company for whatever reason. That's you. And again, you want to always keep it positive. Keep the entire, all your answers, keep them very, very positive. One of the things we talked about last night in the interview class is the beauty of interviews is you get to choose what you say. Nobody's forcing you to say anything. You get to choose. So when you're asked that question, you choose your response. Make it the best response. So, the gentleman in the second row, yes, in the leather jacket. Um, yes. What if you research in a company and you see a position that you think that you would be uh, excellent at, but you also see a, a couple others? Um, how would you, you can't send three different resumes and tailor your resume three different ways for three different positions, especially if. An HR person is going to see it. Like, what's this guy doing? Does he want this? Does he, want this? Um, does he think he's great and everything? How, how, does, how do you do something like that? So the question is, if you are looking on an organization's website or however you find um, their job postings and you see multiple postings for the same organization that you think you might be qualified for and or good at, how do you handle that situation? So I never got to answer your question in the back about going there and the negative, um, but I think it was answered pretty well. That's all I'll I'm say. Sorry. I would never go there. I would keep it uh, off topic and tell what what you're going. She says what you're running to, not you're running away from. That's the best advice. But I wouldn't call. I mean, I would say don't go there. It's it's no good. Nothing good could happen. For you, I did this in Largo, Florida. So I'll be interested in the responses because I think this one could have the most diversity in the response, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, what, what I would do is I would make contact with the HR or the department head in charge of the positions that you're interested in because I would want to hone in on what really is the best fit uh, so that I applied for one position. The one that I, when I really do the work, I see where I think I'm the, it's the best one for me and where I have the most chance for success. But I would have the communication with uh, HR or the department head that you are you saw these other positions and you also think you have the skill set knowledge and experience to do those positions but i personally would do just one and then see hopefully you know if 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 it's one out of a few you'll get in the door and then you'll have be able to have that conversation but if but, i get in the door on one and then there's two others the, i think so I do know what you're saying, and again, what I'm saying is I would, I would try for the, the best one that I think I'm most qualified for. And if I didn't get it, I would also follow up with saying, you know, I saw this other one, I wasn't chosen for this, but is there still an opportunity? That's what I would do. I, again, I'd just be honest about it. I wouldn't play games with it. I, I'd just be real honest about my self-assessment and my submission and then my communication going forward. That's, that's what I would do. Well, and that's also where... That's also where a cover letter you can kind of explain. You can send that one and indicate in that cover letter that you notice the other positions too and that you would be flexible enough to, to you know, would like to be considered for those others or which of, of the three may, might be the best fit. Uh, so that's one way to handle it, I think. Uh, it, it's getting to someone, maybe you're sending it, attaching it in an email. You know, you can put that in the body of the email that says, you know, I, I recognize that you have three positions open. You know, I think I can. I could be a good fit for all of them in one way or another. I feel that I'm best suited for position A. However, I'm very flexible and would like to be considered for the other positions at the same time. Do I all of you read cover letters when people submit resumes? Absolutely. We do. We do. Uh, we do and we don't, I'm going to be honest, mm -hmm. because quite frankly, it depends on how you're applying. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't even have an opportunity to send a cover letter. If you're sending it to me at a staffing company, for example, you're getting it to me first, which is great, and then I'm going to get you on to the, to the company that we're working with that has the opening. So at that point, we're going to maybe attach your cover letter or we're going to send some highlights in an email to the hiring manager to highlight your skills and, and again, maybe reiterate what you're looking for in that, that you put in your cover letter. So I would still not forget the cover letter. I think I would add it, or I would at least, if nothing else, I would include your resume attached to an email and in the body of the email treat that as a cover letter area I'll pass it on but if it's a one paragraph cover letter no I don't read it if it's a 20 paragraph uh, cover letter I don't read it 
If it's if it's ex if it's a couple three, you know, keep it simple, keep it concise, keep it professional, and it will get read most times than not. We don't see a lot of uh, cover letters at you know Beaumont. We typically have nurses and technicians, and they're not writing cover letters. So when I do see a cover letter, I take the time to read it because it, let's face it, that's what sets you aside from you know from anyone else that that has applied. But here's where to answer your question, where I might give some slightly opposite advice. Look at the, all of the positions that are available and the ones that you, maybe there's three that you're interested in. Ask yourself, what is the common thread with these three p positions? Is it that they all service people? Maybe it's patient registration and maybe it's a receptionist and, and maybe it's some uh, other, uh, you know, member service rep or something. But they all have a common theme and that's the theme that you want to focus on in your cover letter. This is what I'm really interested in doing. It appears that there's a number of openings at your company um, that would allow me the opportunity to do that, to work in a customer service role with people, and that's a good way to do it because there are. There are. There's, there's a number of different um, things that you can step into. Find that common theme and then hone in on that. So the question is regarding internal candidates, um, hiring internal candidates. If you're competing with someone who is an internal candidate, um, the, the part of the question is, you know, do employers, um, why do employers interview if they, if they're sure that they're going to give it to an internal candidate? So a lot of a lot of questions regarding internal candidates. So I can just speak from uh, from Beaumont. When we know that we, we're going to fill a position internally, we're not going to post it externally. I, I can tell you, we post a position, a nursing assistant position, overnight we will get 200 applications overnight on our website. So it doesn't behoove us, just from a work <laughs> perspective, to put something out there when we know that that's the type of position that people promote into or transfer into. Now, a lot of employers are affirmative action. Um, so you speak to labor laws. So a lot of employers that are affirmative action, they have to go through the process of posting both internally and externally to remain an affirmative action employer and that's so that they can get, get the advantage of working with federal contracts. So I don't know what company you're referring to, but that may be a reason why you, why you see that. And sometimes, too, we, you know, we, we may believe that someone internally will fill the position. We don't know that for sure and we don't want to fall behind in our recruitment process. So sometimes we'll post it both places at one time because we're not sure, and we don't want to be 14 days behind to fill a position. No, I think that explains it pretty well. We hire, we, we post internally and then externally, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that situation. And I, about 10% internal uh, promotions versus 90 is, is what, my experience here has been so. So affirmative action is a differential. Then, is kind of what you're saying. It could be. I, I don't. It could be. I don't know the particular positions that you saw or companies that you saw, but there could be. I can't speak for others, but that is a situation where you are required as an affirmative action employer to post both to to try to reach out and get all of the candidates that you can, whether it's uh, by race or by veteran status, disabled status, that sort of thing. Karen, did you want to add anything? No, I, I would totally agree with what Lisa said, basically. But I, I, I hear your frustration because a lot of times you just don't know. You see a posting and you don't know if it's internal or if it's an external type posting. And that it's tough. I mean, it's just a numbers game. You know, you're, you're applying to various places and, and you know, the, most of the time those you're just not going to hear back on, you know, because it probably was internal. And it is unfair. I, I see it all the time. So... I, I feel your pain there. You can't always tell what it, what kind of posting it is, and it's a shame. Some corporate websites will tell you right on there this is an internal posting, and and I appreciate when you know when a company does that, but they don't all do that. Well, oftentimes you can read between the lines because the requirements are like you have to be an internal person to know all this. Stuff. Exactly. Because exactly. Yeah. Website. Right. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we did have one question. Um, we have been talking about interviewing and applying for specific positions and researching companies before you send out your resume. Well, when you're researching companies, I'm just trying to get a familiarity with where would you look on a company website or where would you find the literature on how you work with Americans or employees with disabilities? 
as far as recruiting somebody with a disability and placing them in an employment field in your organization. Where would you find that kind of information in the organization you're trying to apply at? So if I understand the question correctly, and please correct me if I didn't get this right, if you are researching a company and you, you want to know what your potential employer's um, hiring process or stance or philosophy is regarding hiring people with disabilities, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Where would you find the information? I would Where contact the HR department, mm -hmm. the Human Resources Department. I would go directly to them and ask them what their policies are for hiring people with disabilities, hiring people with uh, veterans of foreign wars, you know, all, all the different uh, classifications that they, may have, that they may be looking for. I would talk to HR directly. I think the only thing that I would have to add to that on the websites, we'll usually put that we're an equal employment opportunity uh, provider. Or if you're affirmative action, you have a statement that says that on your website. But also connecting with some of the um, organizations that work with disabled individuals. Um, they may have a relationship, you know, with our hospital. Um, that could be a way too, but probably the easiest and quickest way is through the HR department, as Brian suggests. Karen, did you want to say anything? Yeah. I, I would. I would certainly agree with that, and I, I think that you know you want to go right to the HR because you're going to get the best answers. And uh, you, you know, large corporations are equal opportunity uh, providers or employers. Uh, and uh, if, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, we're always just looking for the person who's the best best fit, fit for the job, regardless. Um, you know, we always look at, and at Kelly Services, again, such a large corporation, we hire veterans, we hire disabled folks, I mean, we hire, you know, you name it. I mean, we're always looking for the best, best person for the job. Okay. Dawn, in the back. I just wanted to add in reference to that question that um, I think it was from Beaumont. She mentioned going to the organization. There's associations, much like uh, Michigan Rehabilitation Services mm -hmm. and Oftentimes, if the HR people are not aware, if they're new to their position, and go to that organization, they will have previous information of who they worked with at that company, and then a partnership can oftentimes be birthed at that point. Okay, just for the camera, um, what, what Dawn pointed out is a lot of times there are organizations such as Easter Seals that have worked with a company and can help people um, learn more about the company or facilitate um, those relationships, especially if they have a previous working relationship with the organization. Um, to that, I would add um, the Troy Public Library or your home public library um, is a great resource for you for just researching information about an organization. I agree 5 million percent with Brian and the rest of the panel that if you have those specific questions, the best place, the fastest place you're going to find out is call HR. If you need to know more about the company, more about the organization, you want to go a little deeper than what's on the website, your local public library is going to have an absolute ton of resources in print and electronically that can help you find out what you're looking for. So I have to get in a plug for the library before this <laughs> evening ends. So I think we have time for one more question. This lady in the second row in the gray sweater. How about you? Uh, you were talking before about the importance of a cover letter. If you were laid off, would you add that information to your cover letter or just explain the circumstances, for example, or would you wait for the interview? How would you address that? So the question is, if you've been laid off, how do you, how do you, what is the best way to present that topic? Do you present it in the cover letter? Do you present it in the interview? Do you present it at all? How do you handle that? Well, I, I can say that first off, you know, if your resume is indicating that you've been off for a long period of time, you need to explain that, what you've been doing during that period of time, either both on your resume and maybe in a cover letter. If you've been laid off and, it, and if you're concerned with how to explain that I've been laid off, just be honest. I mean, and again, you can explain that in, in a cover letter. There was a workforce reduction. You know, part of, I was part of a workforce reduction. That can be put in your cover letter. It can be also put in your um, resume, you know, from the day that you were laid off through present if, if you haven't been working you know, you put that as a bullet point that said, you know, laid off as a result of a workforce reduction or whatever it may have been. Uh, that's the best way to handle it, I think, is just to, you know, not dance around it and just say that's what it was. And again, you can cover, put that in a cover letter and, you know, you can indicate that that's an opportunity to say, you know, in spite of that, you've kept up with your skills, you know, that type of thing. So you would add it to the resume directly? 
I, I would personally, mm -hmm. because I'll tell you, I, I always say this, the, the first two thirds of the first page of your resume is the most valuable real estate. That is what an, a, a hiring manager will look at. And if they only go through the first, first third of it or first two thirds of that front page, if they don't see what they want to see there, they're on to the next one. You're in the B and the C pile now. You're not, you're off the A pile. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to to say that you've been doing something during that time frame. If you've been off, laid off for a year, to put nothing and have your last, or some, unfortunately for some folks, it's even been longer. Mm -hmm. And to put nothing and see that last date of employment, you know, was 2010, and nothing after that, it's, I gotta tell you, it's the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, here's my, my thought on that. If your layoff was within the last month, it's, I don't think you need, necessarily need to adjust. I mean, you can talk about it, you can, you know. But you can't, you, you don't want your resume to show, you can't show your resume, you're, still, you're there presently. Mm -hmm. So you have to put the end date. Let's say December 2013 was your last employment month. So you put that and then you can talk about it. Or you can put something right above that that says, you know, that there was a layoff and you're actively seeking employment. Okay. Anybody else? I would agree. I think, you know, if you wait for an interview, you're not, you may not have your chance to tell your story. You have your chance to tell your story in your cover letter, your resume. And I think it's really important, too, if you're not working, um, as uh, Karen said, what, you know, what have you been doing in the, in the interim? You know, what have you been doing to keep your skills up? Have you been volunteering? Have you been helping others? Have you, you know, what, what have you been doing? That's really important to tell that piece of the story because that's the first thing that employers are going to hone in on are the gaps in your employment. Um, and they're going to start adding all that up. And as Karen said, it's going to move you from the A pile to the B pile to the C pile pretty quickly if you don't hit it straight on in a cover letter. So I'll just conclude by saying, it's, see, what I said earlier was, it's, if we're thinking about it right now, and we've been laid off a year, workforce reduc reduced for a year, and we're just thinking about it now for this job, it's not too late, but it's too late. You need, as soon as that workforce reduction happens, do something, do something that's positive, that helps you, that hones your skills. Take the opportunity to do something to enhance you personally and professionally. So that when you get to that point, you can really highlight it. And it's going to, and it's going to set you up. It, it could be used to set you apart, right? If I could add one more thing. I've encouraged people to take that, that section of their resume when they have this gap and they have been working. Let's say you've been off the last six months or so, and I ask, what have you been doing? I mean, let's say you've been volunteering at your church to, and doing, doing the books, you know, helping them. You're an accounting person. You've d done something like that. Maybe you're, you know, child care that you're involved in. Maybe you're caring for an elderly person. Think about the skills involved with all of those things I just mentioned. And I tell people to treat that as bullet points just like you would the rest of your resume. Put down these bullet points because, and write them in such a professional way that they sound, if you're caring for an elderly person in your family, can you, you can imagine you can come up with some bullet points that says, you know, that you've been, you know, that what you've been doing organizationally with that, how you've, you know, assisted them in what you've done. Maybe it's driving, maybe it's shopping, maybe whatever. I mean, you can certainly treat that as, as if it's a professional job that you've been doing. So bullet point that information and write it in such a way that, you know, it, these are still skills that you have that you've been using and you've been st staying active and keeping sharp with all, with all your skill set, or skill sets, I should say. And then also do address that in a cover letter too, then. So I would, yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Okay. All right, panel, any last words of wisdom for our, for our group? Stay positive, seriously. I, I, I can't tell you how important that is because it comes across in a phone interview. You know, I tell people when you're on a phone interview, you have to smile and stand up because you'll be, you'll be just m m so much more effective. You, I can hear when people are smiling through the phone, and you can too. So uh, you have to stay positive. It's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. It's, you know, you can't give up. You just keep trying. You keep honing, you keep honing that resume. I have a lot of, I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, but, you know, I want to apply for this job, and it's just slightly different. I say, well, have you done what's slightly different? Yeah, I pretty much have, but, but it's not on your resume. Well, you mean I've got to rewrite my resume? 
Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. You have to rewrite your resume. You have to tweak your resume for those positions. And th that position, you might not have in included some of that information on your first resume, but if you've done it, you better get it in there and, and tweak it for that, for that one you're applying for. You have to do that. I know it's like work, it's homework, but it's worth it. I'm telling you, you've got to get to the top of the A-pile, and you've got to have that resume looking so sharp and so mar such like a marketing piece about yourself, your skills and everything, right at the top of that first page, and that first two-thirds of that first page, so that I go, okay, right on the top of the A-pile, right away. I guess just focus in on what you really want. Um, because if you're just applying for positions because they're just positions and you need a job and you want to work, as Karen said, that's going to come through in your interview. You're not going to sound enthusiastic. The employer's not going to see, you know, what are, what's the long-term potential of this employee because you just don't have that interest. So be selective, manage your expectations, and remain positive. I think that's really important. So I would just leave with believe that good things are going to happen. Okay, good things are going to happen, and you need to believe it every day you wake up and go through the day. Good things are going to happen. That is a great note to end on. Let's give a round of applause for our panel. Thank you.